New Life. I'm Jamie Hiscox and I lead the senior high ministry. My favorite comfort food is probably a good steak. And my favorite dessert, it's got to be cookies. Hi, I'm Jeanette Burmaster, the Director of Communications and Connection at New Life Petrolia. My favorite comfort food is not your typical comfort food, but I love canned pineapple with cottage cheese. Also, my favorite dessert would be angel food cake with strawberries and whipped cream or vanilla ice cream. So good. Sam Welton here, lead pastor at New Life Assembly. And I'm asked, what would be my spouse's idea of a perfect date? Well, you need to know my wife, Virginia, or V, as most people would call her, is a, is a, a woman who just likes, this is going to sound really cheesy, just likes to hang out and spend time with me. Seriously, her perfect date would be bass fishing on a nice calm morning after I made her bacon and eggs for breakfast. And then maybe we drove into town after that uh, and did a little looking around in the store. I mean, very, very simple uh, dates. And uh, I love that about her. Hey, New Life, Chris here. Uh... I currently am the guy that's in charge of running the junior high voltage ministry, uh, which is usually grade six to eight. Um, uh, the question I have for today is, apart from Jesus, who is a person from history, dead or still alive, that I would love to spend a day with and why? That person for me, uh, you might be shocked, it's not a hockey person, but it would be Travis Pastrana. Uh, if you don't know who that is, I encourage you to look him up because... He does a lot of wild stuff like on dirt bikes, either be side by side or rally cars. He's just a guy that's into doing some cool stuff on with anything with an engine. So I think for me, that's who it would be just because I feel like we have a similar personality. He might be a little more crazier than I am, but uh, still, it would be a blast to hang out with him. Hi, I'm Tim Brown, and I'm the community care pastor here at New Life Assembly. And I was asked the question, what would be my perfect pizza? Well, first off, it would have to have bacon. It would have to have pepperoni. It would have to have ham and green olives. But then a thin, sli a thin crust and the crust with cheese. And after I'm done eating to the final crust, doused with a big stick of butter. That's the best.
thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness what you're looking for for God so loved the world that Hey guys, um, so we've been working together as an intern team at the church now for about a week and a half, and it's going really well. The only thing is, Mason seems to want to make everything a competition. Well, I mean, you'll see. Just watch these next few Josh, days. Emily, Eva, I challenge you guys to a trick shot competition. I'm going to start with this tennis ball, down the railing, across into the gym, and in the net on the other side. Here we go. I see a trick shot and I got one more for you. I'm going from this pitcher's mound, through the gym doors, through the other side of the gym, all the way to the offices, off every office door, back to the gym, and in the net.
Mason and Josh, they were okay. Try this. That was pretty crazy. You can come tell us below in the comment section who you guys think had the best trick shot. Spoiler alert, still probably me. Anyway, this summer in all of our kids moments we're going to be talking about the armor of God. And you may be thinking, what is that? That's what I'm here to do today, is explain that to you. So the armor of God is made up of many parts. But what it does is it protects us. And you may be thinking, well it protects us from what? When we talk about church and when we talk about Jesus, as Christians and people who love Jesus, we want to do what he says. And the armor of God protects us against sin. And sin is anything that prevents us from following Jesus' way. It's what we say, think, and do that doesn't follow what he tells us. And you may have seen one of these before. It's a face mask. People use it a lot when they go outside, when they go to the supermarket, when they go to the mall, to protect themselves and others from diseases. The armor of God is like that. It's like a spiritual face mask for your whole body. We'll be going through all the different parts, but I'm going to give you an overview today. The armor of God is found in Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 18. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. It goes on to talk about what it's for, and I'll get into that later, but I want to get to the parts of it. So it says, Stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and with the breastplate or shirt of righteousness in place, and have your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel, and the gospel is the good news of Jesus. In addition, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. That may seem like a lot of words, but I promise you, over the summer, you're going to find out what every single one of those pieces of the armor of God is. It's not just going to be me either. Emily, Mason, Eva, they're all going to be here teaching you guys about the armor of God. We hope you tune in every single week so that you can get the full picture by the end of the summer. And right after this, we have a couple special announcements that I think you guys will like. This summer is going to look very different, but we're looking for ways to stay connected and keep everyone involved. Last summer at one of our day camps we did a food drive and it went super well. Because of that we're going to do it again, but we're going to put a twist on it. What we want to do this year is a summer long food drive and we're going to set goals all throughout the summer and if you guys can reach them, we're going to have punishments for our leaders. At 250 items in, I'm going to get pie in the face. At 500 items, I'll get a bucket of ice water dumped on me. At 750, I'm going to get slimed. At 1,000 items, I will dye my hair whatever color you guys want for a week. If you can make it to 1,500 items, we'll all temporarily dye our hair. And at 2,500 items, I'm going to dye my hair and keep it until I come home for Christmas. We hope you guys can rise to the challenge and make it to the top. We'll be posting videos as you guys reach the goal point so you can see what happens to our stuff. You can bring your items to the church for collection and we'll keep you updated with how many items are being brought in. Good luck, everybody. Good morning, everybody. It's just me, Pastor Ron. I'm here to pick up the offering. Well, I'm wearing my COVID mask as well, aren't I? Well, I tell you what, there was a time when you wore one of those masks into a, into a store, they think you were there to rob the place. But today, of course, masks are commonplace out in public and in stores and public areas. 
and it's not unusual. Some people think that the church, we should be wearing masks because that's what we do. We steal. We All we want is money, and that's really not the truth at all. All we want is not to rob you of the opportunity for the blessing of God on your life. In Acts chapter 20, <clears throat> Paul's leaving, he's heading back to Jerusalem. And he's on the beach, and it's a, a sad farewell, a difficult farewell. But one of the words that he leaves them, now if you had a red letter edition Bible, you know that in the Gospels, all the words of Jesus are in red, you will find a little flash of red in Acts chapter 20, in verse 35, as Paul quotes something that Jesus said. The Lord himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Sometimes that's very difficult for us to understand. But Paul says, the Lord Jesus himself said that. And the great thing is that I can sit here and say, thank you for your giving. Thank you for your continued support of New Life Assembly, New Life Missions, New Life work that goes on in our community and beyond as we extend and, and present the gospel to our community. Thank you for your faithful, faithful giving. And I pray today that your blessing would be real, that as you give, you will be more blessed than if you received. Now, there are several ways you can give, of course. There's one you can uh, e-transfer to accounting at newlifeassembly.com. You can also go on our website and you can give through a credit card. You can give through PayPal. You can actually just, some people are still doing it, They're taking an envelope with their offering and bringing it and putting it in the slot in the building at the door at the back. Also, of course, you can always just put it in an envelope and send it snail mail, and we know that it will get here. Again, thank you for your giving. Thank you for your continued support, and we continue to pray God's blessing upon you because it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. God bless you as you give. Welcome to this segment of Taking Care of Business. We're outside of uh, Mr. B's and Leisure Lane here. One of great businesses is I've used this business to come in here and get alterations made. I, I bought my last suit here. Listen, New Life Assembly, and whoever's watching this video, we need to support our businesses, our local businesses, right here in Petrolia. And at Mr. B's, Leisure Lane, SciTech and Company, we have other clothing businesses. I want to encourage you. We need to take care of the businesses in Petrolia, and let's do that. Over this next few weeks, let's bombard these businesses and buy local as we take care of business here in Petrolia. Hi, my name's Don Welton. I've been a Christian for 47 years. My life didn't start out that way. My mother was pregnant to a man that went overseas in the army and he was killed in France and uh, I've never seen him. And then she got uh, involved with another man 
and uh, he was my stepfather. He raised me. Uh, they were party people, and over time, that's kind of where I fit in. I become a party person, and as time went on, and then I met Mary, and uh, we started going together, and we got married, and we had three children, and the party scene kind of kept going, and it kind of went from bad to worse in our in our marriage. And uh, so one Sunday, she decided, she said to me, on Saturday night, actually, she was going to go to church Sunday morning. And I said, well, okay. And she's taking the kids and going. And uh, uh, so then, when they come home that Sunday, Sam said to me, Dad, and there's going to be a missionary at our church the next Sunday night. Would you go with me? And I said, yeah, as a good father, I thought that was a good thing to do. So I went, and then from there, we went to uh, Sarnia a week after that, Sunday night after that, and uh, we, uh, the James McKnight was there preaching, and they had a sermon which basically was on heaven and hell, and I said, well, I don't want to go to that place. So I give my heart to the Lord that night, and I come home, and the next day, everything was changed. It's hard to explain. Uh, everything looks so beautiful, and and uh, our, my whole home changed. And uh, I became a, um, uh, a man then that wanted to raise his kids the right way. And uh, so then, uh, you know, it's, it's the best life I feel that anybody, best life I've ever had. I've had the other side and nothing compares to what I have now in, in the Lord Jesus. And you know, now I have a heavenly father that uh, looks after me. I can talk to him and, and you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a great life. There's no, there's no other life like it. And I just want to say, if, you, if you're struggling in your life, this is the thing to do. You know, accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, and this is my testimony. Thank you very much. You 
give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only one who can you turn mourning to dancing you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only one who can you turn graves into gardens you turn bones into army you turn seas into highways you're the Playhouse Theatre in Petrolia, Ontario. Well, I'm not here to see a theatre production. I'm actually here, I'm not in the theatre itself, I'm actually up in the clock tower. Now it's pretty loud up here actually of all the noises that are around here. There's some construction going on down there. But what a great view. As I look around this town and see actually how many trees we have in Petrolia, I can look over here, look to the west, and I can see the top of my house just over here beyond the Presbyterian and the Catholic Church, the United Church right there. I look to my left and there's the library and where we have the Saturday farmers markets and then straight out there actually we see the tops of the buildings of uh, downtown Petrolia and we have an, one of the buildings that have solar power. I didn't know that till now, but that's what happens when you get above the fray. When you get above everything. There's nobody else up here but me. I can take my time. I can look around. I gotta speak kind of loud because there's a little bit of wind and there's construction, but there's something important about getting above and out of the fray and out of the noise and out of the crowds that are down there. Up here, I don't need a mask. I'm COVID free up here. They actually checked me for temperature and, and gave me instructions and all this stuff. I had to wear a mask to get up here and they made sure that, of course, I was COVID free. So, here I am up in the tower. What a great view it is it's kind of nice but one of the thing about this gives you a perspective that you don't see before you get to see so far as you get up high but I've always been that way wherever I travel I love to go up into whatever mountains whatever cliffs there might be and spend time there I grew up in an area that had high places that I could get up and enjoy and I want to tell you something there's something about being at the top now, it's in the middle of summer. It's a warm day. Now, mind you, it's not bad up here because it's kind of breezy. 
but I remember as a kid that we would play King of the Castle in the winter. And in the winter, we would pile up the snow. The, the plows would come, pile up the snow, and, and you would have to get on top of that hill to be the King of the Castle. Well, it was great when you were the King of the Castle because you were at top, and it's so much easier to stay at top and push people down than it is to get up there because it's a, the fray is there. And that's what it's like. Up here, I'm alone. I can do what I want. Down there, I'm paying bills. I'm concerned about my health. I'm concerned about relationships and friendships. I'm concerned about family, all of that stuff. But it's nice to get up here. But the fact is, I may be up here for a little while, but I can't live up here. You can't live on the mountaintop. You can't go there and stay there. Down there is where the production is. Down there is where we become a society with one another and growing together as a society. Up here, you're above it all, but you can't live up here. I want to talk to you a little bit about the mountain view here today. In Scripture, there's a lot said about high places. So throughout Scripture, we see people that are going up. Moses, of course, he went up into the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. Abraham took Isaac up into a mountain <clears throat> to offer him to God as God provided a ram for the sacrifice. Elijah, up on Mount Carmel, battled 400 Baal prophets and God was victorious in that on the mountaintop. Jesus himself took disciples up to the top of a mountain and was transfigured before them. What story after story, even in the other side of things, the Tower of Babel, they said, would reach to the top, would reach to God, and of course, it became a thing of the past. Even today, you go into the big city, you want to go up in the CN Tower, you want to go up in the Empire State Building, you want to go up into the highest building, the highest point. But we know we can't live there. There's another person that really, he began in the mountaintop, and he's a guy that you don't even need to know your Bible to know this name. You don't need to know your Bible to know this story. If you're just joining us today, and you have no background biblically or anything like this, you'll know this guy. He landed a ship. It was the first shipwreck on the earth in the top of a mountain. Noah. Noah, the flood, the ark, and the animals. <clears throat> That's his story. We know that story. Well, as after the, the storm and the waters came in 40 days and 40 nights, do you realize that Noah was in that ark with those animals and with his family for a year? We think 40 days and 40 nights. No, it was a year that he was there. And then when he finally came out, when the ark came to rest, it says, in the mountains of Ararat, it stopped. And then after time, the water receded. And then there came a time when <clears throat> God told Noah to get off the ark and take all the animals with him. Now, I don't know about you, but if I have a boat full of animals that I, I'm supposed to get to a place where they can reproduce and replenish the earth, I have one of each, remember, male and female of each. Well, we're on top of a mountain. I don't know if Noah was prepared for the top of a mountain getting animals down. Some say how to get all those animals on there, and, and someone may answer, well, they took baby animals on there. Well, let me talk to you about a baby elephant. If a baby is born 200 pounds like an elephant would be, by the time a year comes around, he's over a thousand pounds. And if you got to get him off a mountain, it's not like you can say, okay, you take that in. No, there has to be some planning to go into that. After coming out of the ark, Noah has his family, his sons, his, his wife, their, uh, the sons' wives, and they got to find shelter. They've got to find a place to live. They've got to find a way to produce food. All of these things, the basics of life. And what does he do? You can find the story in Genesis chapter 6, 7, and 8. And you'll find in chapter 8, you'll find a verse that says, Noah and all the animals, they got off the ark. The first thing Noah did was he built an altar. I want to encourage you today. I know that you have a lot of pressure. I know you have a lot of responsibility. You're, you're concerned about your family. You're concerned about their health. You're concerned about your shelter. You're concerned about your job. You're concerned about many, many things. I want you to decide today that you're going to build an altar. Like Noah, the first thing he did, not necessarily the first thing he had to do, 
he had a lot of things to do. But what he did was build an altar to the Lord. Why? Because he knew that life will happen down there. He knew he had to get his family, all those animals, down off of that mountain and begin life. Well, Scripture says, where does my help come from? It says, my help comes from the Lord. There's another mountain that I want to talk to you about. It's Mount Calvary. It's the mount on which Jesus was crucified and died for you and for me. That's where we need to begin. That's where we build our altar. That's where we say, yes, Lord. That's where we say, thank you, Lord. That's where we say, Jesus, I invite you into my life. I thank you that you died, but you rose again victorious that I might have life. And in this life, there be mountains and there be valleys. But all times, we need to build those altars before the Lord. Well, here I am, back on the ground again. As nice as it is to be up in the tower, getting a view of everything, it's nice to be on the ground. Now, on the ground, it just seems a little warmer, and the, and the dust is up, and the wind is up. But, you know what? This is where we live. We live on the ground. This is where we have relationships. This is where we earn money. This is where we spend money. This is where we... Uh, uh, grow together. You can't live always on the mountain. In the one story in the New Testament when Jesus takes Peter, James, and John and takes them up to a mountain, while they there, are there in Matthew 17, it says that they are transformed. Tran he is transfigured before them. And they have a visit with Moses and Elijah, a couple other mountain men. Moses, of course, with the Ten Commandments. Elijah beat the prophets of Baal on the mountaintop. But here they are with Jesus. Now, Peter, James, and John are overwhelmed. Peter even suggests, he says, Lord, it's good that we're here. I need to build a shelter for Moses, a shelter for Elijah, and a shelter for you. And, and while he was still speaking, Scripture reveals, God spoke from the heavens, a cloud descended, and the voice of God came out and said, This is my son. And when the cloud lifted, and Peter, James, and John looked up, it says, And we saw Jesus alone. If your mountaintop experience brings you to a place where it's just you and Jesus, you've had a good mountaintop experience. Peter wanted to build shelters, but the Lord said, You don't live on mountains. You live right down here. You live on the ground here. So they came down again. And of course, Jesus went and went to Mount Calvary for you and for me. I want to encourage you today that if you've never made a decision to follow the Lord, that you do that today. Ah, you're going to have highs, you're going to have lows, you're going to have times when you can just see for miles and there's going to be times when your feet are on the ground. Scripture says that He is the God of the mountains. He's the God of the valleys. He's a God wherever you are. So I encourage you today, as we think about this wonderful town of Petrolia, and it's nice to look from above and see everything, but this is where we live. And so I want to pray today for this town. Lord, I pray your blessing will be upon this wonderful town of Petrolia. All the people, all the businesses, all the interactions, Lord, the visitors that come through here, the investors, we pray your favor will be upon it, Lord God. We pray that you would increase and you would grow this community as we grow together in you. I pray for all of the different churches that are walking through this, this pandemic, Lord, and challenges, Lord, for the people of faith and the people around them. I pray your favor upon them. I pray for the blessing upon the council of this community and the leaders in this community, Lord. Bless them. Let the sun and the, and, and the favor of God rest upon them today. We pray that the God of the mountains and the God of the valleys will continue to be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like us to pray for you, you'd like to know more about following Jesus, you can contact us on the website. Contact us, we will get back to you. We would love to know, get to know you and to teach you more about the Word and about following the Lord. God bless you. Enjoy your mountains, enjoy your valleys. 
the Lord's with you in both areas. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. to the altar the father's arms are open why forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of jesus
Hi, I'm Pastor Dan, and I have the privilege of doing the pastor's heart this week and just kind of sharing with you what's on my heart. And uh, I trust you enjoyed Pastor Ron's message today. It was a great word. Uh, just looking at the, the comparison between uh, Noah and being on Mount Ararat and Jesus on Mount Calvary, the difference between a reboot and a, a new start. And uh, I can tell you that from my own life, I tried many times to reboot my life, to, to try and adjust my life and improve my life. And I never really got anywhere until I met the Lord and put my faith in Christ. And I literally, as I shared last week in my message, was born again and I had a brand new start. All the old things had gone away and my life had become new. I had new hope, I had new joy, I had new faith and a new opportunity to change my life and to live with purpose and meaning. And that's one of the things that has really struck me lately with this whole coronavirus and the lockdowns and the economic uh, hardship that it's created for a number of people, businesses as well as individuals who have lost their job or are temporarily laid off. And uh, it just really got me thinking about how important it is to remember the hope that we have in the Lord. We don't just have uh, a temporary hope, uh, a hope if things go well, I hope everything works out type of thing. We literally have a hope that whether the circumstances of life work out the way we hope or want, that hope abides because it's a hope that is rooted and grounded in the gospel. It's grounded in Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made for us when he died on Calvary for our sins. And he gave us the opportunity to have new life, a brand new start, where all the stuff, the failures, the, the mistakes, the sins, the hardships, we could put behind us, and as Paul says, uh, in the New Testament, we can set our eyes on the prize and run the race as if we intend to win. And uh, the good news of the gospel gives hope to every person who accepts it. We have the hope of eternal life. We have the hope of knowing that we are God's children. We have the hope of knowing that we can ask anything of the Lord and he will hear us. And if we ask in accordance with his will, he will grant us whatever it is that we ask of him. That's the confidence John says we have in approaching God in his first epistle. And it's those kind of things that make the difference I find in my own life. Reminding myself of all of the promises of God, all of the things in the scriptures that assure me that my hope is not built on shaky ground. It's built on a solid foundation. And I have hope. I have hope for the future. I have hope for today. And I trust you know that hope. The Bible says that we should always be prepared to give an account of the hope that we have within us. And one of the ways that we can do that is by sharing that hope with other people. We can share it in terms of the gospel, but we can also share it in terms of being an encouragement, in terms of showing kindness, grace, mercy, forgiveness. We live in a world today that seems to be filled with animosity and anger, and I'm just stunned by the rhetoric that you hear on social media with people you know, somebody makes a mistake and it's like the dogs attack and they just, you know, tear a strip off the poor person. Well, I can tell you that a kind word goes a long way in a world like that. And so this week, I just encourage you to look around at your friends and neighbors, look around at your co-workers and watch for opportunity to offer hope, to offer encouragement, to maybe offer a compliment to maybe encourage them with something they've done well or how much they mean to you. Maybe take time this week to remind your loved ones and your family members that they're important to you, that you love them, that they matter to your life. I trust that you have the hope of the gospel and I encourage you, if you don't,
turn to Him. He'll give you a new hope, a new start, and a new life. God bless.